You are listening to The Call-In, a series of conversations recorded by Array with filmmakers of color and women of all kinds to discuss feature, narrative, and documentary work. This conversation with Array releasing filmmakers, Sujata Day, director of Definition Please, and Agun Darshi, director of Donkey Head, was recorded on February 3rd, 2022. Both films are now streaming on Netflix. Hi, Sujata. <laughs> Hi, Agum. Hi, Agum. How are this you? Good, good. This is exciting because I I do have a lot of questions to ask you. And starting with the script, because you wrote the script, mm-hmm. and I'm always curious as to um, another filmmaker and screenwriter, what your process is in terms of writing, because I know... I, screenwriters who write every morning from 4 to 6 a.m. And I'm just not one of those screenwriters. I write when I'm inspired. So I don't force myself to sit down and write if I don't have anything to write about. So going back to the beginning with Donkey Head and the script, which is such a beautiful script, uh, I would love to hear the, the process behind the inspiration for it and how you actually sat down to type out the words. (laughs) <laughs> well the script took a really long time to write like I actually have an email from like 10 years ago of someone giving me notes on like one of the first drafts so it took a really long time because I was uh I was just in process of like I, I didn't quite know exactly how to do it you know like I I read the books and things like that but and and I had written some other screenplays but this was really my first like one that I felt like it was doable. Um, So at first it was very much like, oh, I'm inspired to write this thing. I'm going to do it. In the process, I shelved it. I put it away for years, you know, and came back to it. And then I've also had kids. And so I have twin boys who are five. And the one thing I've learned is that I need structure and that even if it means 20 minutes a day, it's the, it, it just kind of gets that muscle going and allows me to be like, I did something, I accomplished something. And so after they were born, I went back to the script, maybe when they were a year old, and um, and then I would just literally put in 20 minutes, like every single day. Um, and then I applied to the Whistler Film Festival Lab in 2018. And that's kind of where it went from like, just sort of like a part-time thing to like, no, no, I'm going to make this thing and it's going to, I'm going to dig deep and try to make it as like honest as I can. Um, and and then I really committed to it as like a job. So I was like more than 20 minutes a day, you know, and like really kind of pushing out one draft after another because I had more people that I had to, you know, I had to um, talk to about it and that were counting on me to make it happen. Um, so that was kind of my process, but I, I really like, for me, 20 minutes is so doable because you usually go over and if you don't, you don't feel that bad about yourself. <laughs> And it's kind of amazing what you can like when you have like the constraints and when you have like so many other things to do. Sometimes I find that that it just really allows like you, you can't edit yourself and it just allows for that creativity to flow. How about yourself? I'm curious what your process was. My process is all for every single project. It's like I get an idea and I get really excited about it and then I turn out the script in a feature script, usually in a few weeks. And then if it's a pilot script, like in four or five days. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. That but, is that's, so amazing. but listen, listen, that's what I call the vomit draft. It's right. The, it's the first draft of like, it's going to be really shitty. And for me, it's all about the page count in that first draft. So I'm get trying to get to the if it's a if it's a half hour, I'm trying to get to that 35 page mark. If it's um, a feature, I'm trying to get to that 90 page mark. And so once I I'll do like 10 to 15 pages a week if it's a feature, and just kind of turn them out. And I don't give myself any any time in terms of day, so I can't do like 20 minutes a day. I'm like, okay, I've I've given myself the goal of 15 pages a week. So if that means 15 pages in one day, then that means 15 pages in one day. And then I get to like kind of chill for the rest of the week. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. So do you start with a treatment? Are you somebody who's very sort of organized for your thoughts and you, you create like, you know, beats and cue cards and all of that? Or are you just literally, you have an idea, you vomit on the page 
how, how do you work? It's it's that's different for me for every script. So sometimes oh. I just get an idea and I'm like, oh, this story is just starting to flow out of me. And I just start writing the scenes. And it could be that I write the last scene first and then my characters help me get to that last scene. But lately, um, especially over the pandemic and I've, I've changed in terms of I'm writing out more of a huge outline first mm -hmm. and then writing from that outline. So it's a very large syn synopsis, which could be anywhere from like 18 to 20 pages long for a feature. And then I plug that into final draft. So the sweet scenes are already there and I just have to put in the dialogue. And this I learned from Thomas Lennon's book, how to I believe it's called How to Write Movies for Fun and Profit. And one of the first things they say in the book is, if you're trying to make movies for Sundance, put this book down. <laughs> but there's a really great way of mapping out the script in prose and scenes before plugging it into Final Draft, where when you do plug it in, you're already like 25 pages in. Oh, that's amazing. That's so really... I highly recommend that book. Yeah, because that makes you, that motivates you so much more, right? To keep going. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So so I, it's been different now. I go back and forth from just writing to having it all outlined first. Um, but in terms of now I'm working more with networks and studios, they obviously want to see the outline first and the idea of it and the characters. So, so that is training me to kind of focus on that more as mm -hmm. opposed to just diving into a script. Mm -hmm. So another thing I wanted to ask you is, and I'm really jealous of this, in Canada, it feels like there's a ton of support for indie filmmakers and um, we don't really have that support in terms of grants and money and um, I would just love your thoughts and how you feel about, you know, raising money for your film and how that all came together. You, you mentioned the Whistler Film Lab, which sounds really cool. And was it uh, winter when you went there? Uh, was it snowing? Did you ski? <laughs> <laughs> Did you hit the slopes? But also just in terms of, um, I, I've had, I have a lot of Canadian friends who have gotten a lot of grants for their creative endeavors. So I'm curious about that. Yeah, actually, that's a really good question because I'm also really curious about what your process was and how you got those, like you, you have such, you have such amazing cast and how you, I'm assuming they were all, well, anyways, we'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, Canada is like a huge support for, um, for the arts and they do have a lot of grants and in some ways it's uh it's still very competitive but in other ways it's also um just kind of like a nice foundation so that you if you get it like we got we got telefilm and that was that just opened the doors to so many other possible grants that we could get in order to make our funding we still ended up having a gap so we put our own money back into the film and then once the film was done we reached out to private investors who were not Canadian so that's kind of how we did it um like anything like people have criticisms about it as well like it's um personally I think it's a really great um avenue because it's worked for me uh but I can also see that maybe doesn't work for certain people because they're not writing within the realm that they want. You know, there are certain films that they will give money to more than other films, you know, so it, it's, it's not necessarily for everyone. Like definitely like genre films, I think have a much harder time to like get funding. Um, but I think it's just like a nice, it's just like a nice leg up if you can kind of get into that like sweet spot with them, you know, it's nice to be part of a country that really supports its artists. I, I've seen a lot of indie Canadian films that are so good and that don't go anywhere, you know, that have gotten all the funding, that have gotten all the support, but Canada is a much smaller country. You know, we just don't necessarily have like the, the, the press and sort of like the vastness of people to really propel a movie upwards. So, um, 
so I, I feel so lucky with Donkey Head because, you know, getting a Ray to back it has just given it like this, just like, just an audience, you know, and that's what any filmmaker wants. So it's kind of a, it's a funny thing being from Canada, you know, like it can really give you that support, but then to kind of go beyond the country can sometimes be a huge question mark. How about yeah. yourself? I'm, I'm so curious with how people do it here because I'm actually also producing another film that's not getting telefilm funding. And so it's been a lot of like private investors and talking to other people and, and it's just a world that seems very difficult. So I, I'm so curious what you, how you started and, and how you got the right, like what was your first step? Yeah, it was very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, like you said, um, I think my first step was I was at Sundance in 2019 and my friend Justin Chan's film, Ms. Purple was playing there. And he was a huge uh, champion of, or, or inspiration for me to write my script, which I wrote 2017, 2018. And I watched him make and produce two movies in two years. And, and I was just hitting myself like, what am I doing with my time? that he can go out and make these low budget films on his own. And he had raised money from family and friends. And, and I also saw even with Awkward Black Girl, Issa Rae was putting that budget on her credit card. So for me, I was like, well, I'm always gonna be putting my money into definition, please. And, and I guess the question was how much, how much of my money? Right. And, and then while I was at Sundance that year, I. I got an email. I had sold a show uh, in the past year and it was caught up in the Time Warner merger. And so they were returning the rights back to me and uh, it was along with a huge check. So the timing was pretty perfect. And I said, this was money I wasn't aware of that I was getting. And so I put that entire check into my movie. So I was the first investor into my film. And after that, I say it was easier to get more of private investors. Um, just because, because they saw that you were betting on yourself. Yeah, because they they said, oh, you, you have something to lose in this as well. So it makes sense for us. And um, and it was just me having coffees, having lunches, even chatting with my actor friends who most of us are unemployed and don't have money to put into films. So it, it was more about talking to these actor friends and then they would say, listen, I can't put money in, but I have a cousin who is interested in that. And he or she is a doctor or a dentist or not in the industry at all and just wants to see our faces on screen, mm -hmm. is excited for representation. And that's where I raised the rest of the money from these like family friends of friends that I had and they they are really happy with um you know with a Ray coming on board and seeing it on Netflix and having their names next to Mindy Kaling in the credits is always exciting of course. and yeah so so yeah so it's it's been a very cool interesting journey and the raising of the money is definitely one of the hardest parts about the whole thing. Cause once you get the money, I mean, you have the creative, you get your cast and crew together and then you just go do the thing. Um, so it, it was cool when we raised the money. The what was the biggest thing you learned from that process of raising the money? I think the biggest thing that I had to get over was obviously it's hard to ask people for money, you know, especially for a creative endeavor. And I think I just had to get over that and, and think to myself, oh, the worst thing this person can say is no. Mm -hmm. And we're still friends and it's cool, you know, like, <laughs> cause it's a big thing that you're asking for. So you can't put any uh, emotion behind it at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about how good or bad is your script or um, how good or bad or director you are. It's about finances you know so so I really made that kind of uh thing in my head just telling myself hey I'm just gonna ask anyone and everyone that I know and see who I was asking childhood friends 
I was asking friends from middle school, high school, and a lot of them came together and said, yes, of course. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And how did you get Mindy Kaling on board? So that was a shock and a surprise. <laughs> so we, uh, we started our virtual film festival circuit at Bensonville in August of 2020. And I believe it was the best decision we ever made because at the time we were talking to other friends who had films that had been sidelined by COVID and they were waiting. They were waiting mm. for COVID to pass. And here we are two and a half years, years later, later. <laughs> and COVID has not passed. So I think we made a great decision in terms of just putting the film out. And we, I have so many other projects that I'm not one to put all my eggs in one basket. So mm -hmm. I was like, let's just get definition please out and, and see what happens. And um, we started to get really great reviews and press and we, uh, it was, it, it was starting to have a life of its own. We were getting fans at these festivals and they were all regional. So it would play in a little town in Florida virtually. And it would play in, it played four times in Pennsylvania, which was really great because that's where we shot the yeah. film. So then in early October, uh, Mindy was a guest on a virtual fundraising panel. Um, it was a political panel and I was not watching it. And I started getting all this. <laughs> you were not I was, watching it. <laughs> I, was, I was not watching. I think I was, I had gotten an invite and I was like, oh, what time's it at? And I was definitely taking a nap at the time. <laughs> and and um, it was just a lot of kind of celebrity guests talking about, you know, voting, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I start like my phone started blowing up, like emails and text messages from my fellow brown friends being like, dude, Mindy just name dropped you and says she can't wait to watch Definition, please. And I was like, what? I was like, I, was like, I, don't, I, I had never met Mindy. I never worked with her before. And, and I was like, that's really cool. Um, that's amazing. So then I was like, okay. I just like tweeted her. I don't think we were following. I was like, oh my God, thank you so much for showing support to our little baby film that it means so much. And then she retweeted it and all that stuff. And, and I was just like, wow, this is really cool. And uh, then her, my team sent her the screener, the online screener of the film uh -huh. and she watched it and she started supporting it on social media and tweeting about it and Instagramming about it. And then finally in, like August of last year, very recently, actually August or September of last year, I just, I, I followed that rule. The worst thing she could say is no, right? <laughs> so, so, so I wrote her an email and I was like, thank you so much for all the support. Would love to have you come on board as an EP. And she said, yes. And, oh my gosh. and that was that was that. She's so. like, I've been waiting you to ask me for a year. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was really cool because I, I truly feel she's such a trailblazer in terms oh, yeah. of South Asian American stories. And just, you know, I love Never Have I Ever. I love Sex Lives with College Girls. And it's just, you know, let's get more of these stories out. And just to have her on board as support has been amazing. Yeah, the two of you make sense together for sure. That's really awesome. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, but also, so Donkey Head, something that we've been asked in our joint interviews, and it happened when I was watching, because I got um, I got a screener to your movie like a week before it came out on Netflix, and I was watching it, and I was like, all these themes are like the themes of definition, please, and it was, it was like mind-blowing, because, you know, it's yours is a Canadian film, mine's an American film, and yet... I loved the idea that these first generation stories all have this similar, you know, we all have similar experiences to kind of no matter where we grow up um, in terms of our parents being from India or Pakistan or South Asia and then coming over to UK or Canada or, you know, Australia. And I've been hearing across the diaspora, wow, I really connect to this story. And that's what's really cool. Hearing mm. from someone in New Zealand 
a first generation Desi in New Zealand being like, whoa, that's my story too. And how are both of our films are connecting to people on a global level, which I, I didn't really expect to happen. Yeah, neither did I. I mean, I, I you know, it's funny as an actor, you're, you're on these shows or you're doing these films and uh, you don't get those emails from people who are like, oh, you know, I was crying when I watched your film. Like, that's exactly, you know, that's, that's who I am. It just, like you said, or I saw myself. So it feels like a real, um, man, I, I, it's, it's such a treat. You, in a way, you don't, like, I don't know about you, but I wrote this film for myself, you know. Um, I knew that obviously other people were going to watch it, but I did have to kind of let it go and be like, people might hate it. Like, you know, it's going out there into the ether, who knows. Uh, but to know that people are connecting to it and feel a real yearning for these types of stories uh, is really wild and powerful, like beyond anything that I think I've even created. Like, it's just like, well, it, it was like, it's almost like you're a channel, you know, like you, you created this and it came through you and it's out there and it's for other people to really be able to like stand a little bit stronger, a little bit taller because they know that they're being seen and heard, right? Yeah, I, feel, I love what you said. Um, you know, some people might hate it. And that's how I went into making Definition Please as well. I was like, you know, this movie is not going to be for everyone. There's going to be haters. And, and I think that's, a really good and positive way to look at your art. And um, I think what surprises me the most is there haven't been a ton of haters. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, where are they? Come on, I'm ready. I'm ready for the haters, you know? So so I, I'm just surprised by kind of the universal reaction to both of our films um, from people outside of our communities even. Because mm -hmm. we made this film like you said, you made it for yourself. I definitely made it for, you know, Bengali Americans, for Indian Americans. And, and to have folks outside of those specific communities also connect to the film is really wild to me. I totally agree. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very powerful, uh, seductive <laughs> thing because it also makes you realize just like, that that distance is actually quite short and quite small, you know, and it makes me really excited to tell the next story and to see how that lands, but also not getting caught up with like, oh, I hope you like it. Do you like it? <laughs> you know, I think that's probably the biggest thing as a filmmaker, maybe, maybe, maybe at least that's what I think is, is to just like stay true to that, like the lack of expectation and the ability to just sort of put out art and let go of it and see where yeah. it lands you know because not everything's going to be like loved and you know yeah it's 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 a it's a really interesting process to let go of your baby and be like okay you're going to be who you're going to be yeah yeah I'm going to take it back to some uh technical aspects of the film because this this part was really fun for me which was uh choosing my cinematographer and working with him in terms of what we wanted the movie to look like and what the tone was going to be. And Brooks Ludwig, who's my amazing DP, I had worked with on uh, a feature film like a year before. So probably like 2017, 2018 called Blowing Up Right Now. It was an indie film that was shot in 10 days in Burbank. And that you I was acted in? That I was a star in. Yeah. So it was a, <laughs> it was like a very, interestingly enough, like an apocalyptic, apocalyptic uh, comedy and the um, very small cast and crew. And, and I noticed Brooks could work really fast, but still get really good footage. And we had great performances. And, and so I, I kind of always had him in the back of my mind for definition, please, because I knew that we it was gonna be low budget. We weren't gonna have a lot of days to shoot. I needed someone who could work in that kind of um, pressurized environment. And so I asked Brooks right away and he was super down, excited to shoot back home in Pennsylvania. He's and from Pennsylvania. No, well. no, no, my- You're my from town, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but after he shot the film in Pennsylvania, he's been back a few more times shooting oh. other different projects over there. So that's been cool. 
And in terms of how, what I did with Brooks is we had movie dates and we watched a ton of movies. And, you know, some of those were like Wong Kar Wai films and Monsoon Wedding, a lot of stuff because our, we decided on handheld cinematography. So just uh, movies that kind of leaned into that, but also straddled between comedy and drama, similar mm -hmm. to Monsoon Wedding. And, and it would be so great because we pause it and I'd be like, oh, I like this shot and like what's mm -hmm. happening here. And so it was very much of, um, it was all about verbalizing and communicating what I, what I wanted because I knew that on set, I was not going to have time to watch the footage back. Mm -hmm. um, I just really had to have 110% trust in Brooks to, to get the shots. And me as an actor, since I'm acting in a lot of the scenes, I'm like, I know when we get it emotionally, so I'm ready to move on. And then I would like look at Brooks and would be like, do, do we get it? Yeah. <laughs> I did the same thing where you're like, yeah, no. And he, he put up his, yeah. finger, his thumbs like, oh my God, awesome. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. tell me about your relationship with your cinematographer. Yeah, I mean, it, it was similar. I, my, my cinematographer, his name is Leonardo Herrim, and I had done a short film um, at the Crazy Eights, which is sort of like this uh, competition short film thing, um, like a year or two before. And uh, I just remember Leo had this, this is before COVID, so nobody was wearing masks, but he would just had this like great smile and like this ability to... It, he felt like a leader, but was also really respectful and able to kind of create an environment that felt very comfortable. And so he just stood out to me. Um, and so when I was choosing a cinematographer, I had a lot of meetings with different people and I just had a great feeling about Leo because he, he really resonated with the script. Um, he's from Brazil originally, and he just like, he's like, this is my family. <laughs> and I'm like, awesome. Um, and I just loved his sort of like international eye. And by that, I mean, just somebody who has like taste that's beyond what, um, what you usually see in like, you know, cinema and you know, Vancouver, BC, you know, there's a lot of stuff that gets shot up there, but he was, he was able to kind of like see beyond that. And he loved like, you know, Iranian films and he loved, you know, Latin American films. And I, I really, I really responded well to that. And so we started working together months, even before we got funding, because we knew we were going to make the film. We didn't know how much the film was going to be made for, but uh, we knew we were going to make it. And so we kind of had two versions. We're like, okay, one's the quick and dirty and one's the one that's gonna be like for more money. And again, same thing. Like we would just like go through the script scene by scene. And uh, you know, he would send me emails with all of his ideas for, um, for you know what he responded to and, and I would verbalize as well and, and send him pictures and and films that I really loved. Um, for me, Lulu Wang's The Farewell was like a really big, um, a really big one for me because because actually we weren't going for the handheld we were going for like really static shots and um and so and and big families beautiful compositions and so it was just like just trying to understand each other's brain um and then at the end I had this thing called I called it my bible which was basically every single scene in the script was broken down and it had the shot list, it had, you know, wardrobe, it had, you know, music or like the arc, the, the, the arc of the scene, whose scene was it? Like just every single thing that felt like I might need to know on that day. So that for those days where I was completely exhausted, where I just didn't know how to verbalize, I'm like, look here, you know, but me, by that point, me and, me and Leo had already created such a bond uh, over the film that it, it was like we were sharing a brain and it was a really special thing. And same thing, I would look at him and he'd be like, give me the thumbs up or whatever, pull down his mask and like smiled. And then I'm like, oh, he liked it. You know, so it was a really, it was uh, such a special relationship, hey, with your DP. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It, you have to trust each other. It's um, uh, when you get on set, it's almost nonverbal. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think uh, you said a couple things just in terms of your Bible and us both 
being the writer, director, actor in our both of our movies, I feel like we both just had to come overly prepared. Yes. And, and that's what I did too. You know, I was just like on top of everything. And so that when things went wrong, which would always happen, there'd be little things, you know, we'd lose a location or something. Then I could have the capacity to, to fix that problem mm-hmm. on site. And at that moment, because I didn't have to think about all those other things that I had already prepared for, which was the scene and what was it going to, what it was going to look like. And my, re- my rehearsals with my actors and I had memorized my lines. I came to set prepared, you know? So I think that's, that's something that, uh, I see in both of us that we just we just came in we wanted to do well for ourselves and we didn't want to let down the rest of the cast and crew because they were also coming in for my cast and crew like not being paid very much but we we ended up putting them in a nice hotel that was next to a sheets which is an amazing Pennsylvania like 7-Eleven type <laughs> but nice. but it's it's like they they make fresh food there you know oh like, okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so they were very excited I was very excited about introducing them to sheets and nice. um they we took care of them but it was definitely like oh like they're they're flying out from LA or New York to middle of nowhere Pennsylvania to shoot this film with me and I didn't want to let them down so I I have a question about that like were you ever hesitant when you first approached your cast or approached your crew to be like, yeah, I I wrote this thing, I'm directing it and I'm going to be acting in it. Was that ever um, a a question mark for you? Because sometimes that's a, that's an alarm for some people, right? Especially investors, but also for cast and crew to be like, can I trust this person so that they're going to be present for me when the camera's on? It was never a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was never a question for me. Um, I, I was always 110% confident that I was acting in the film and that's, that was going to happen. So when I reached out to my cast and crew, I was like, Hey, I'm playing Monica and this is the role that I think that would be right for you. And, um, in terms of specific cast members, like Ritesh Rajan, I had worked with on a music video (laughs) that we had shot. We did a parody of a whole new world because we had found out that we both had auditioned for the live action Aladdin movie. And and so we worked together really well on that shoot. And we just had this kind of natural, amazing chemistry. So I, I think- I saw it. And you have an incredible <laughs> singing voice. I was actually like- Thank you so much. I mean, <laughs> not, really good, good. <laughs> not good enough for Disney's Aladdin, but that's I okay. Mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Um, but- yeah, so we we I think he was already aware of the way that we work together and I had directed that video which wasn't a very tough video to direct and so he had a taste of my style already. Mm-hmm. And then with Anna, she just um I had only met her Anna Kaja who plays Jaya. She's so I, good. She's so good. I had only met her briefly at a at a gala and I knew that she would be amazing for that role. And I'm just uh, so thankful that she said yes, because we had never really had a conversation outside of just meeting briefly. So um, I hope that maybe like my past work convinced her to be like, oh yeah, she can do this. So. And so did you have rehearsals with your actors? We had some rehearsals. We didn't have rehearsals with Anna. Um, With Tesh, he had come over to the apartment And I told him, I said, hey, it's just going to be a very casual read through. I just want to like hear the lines. He came in and he's like sobbing on my couch, like full on giving this performance. And I was like, oh shit, I got to bring it. Like I got to get up to, because I'm just like reading my lines from the script because I hadn't, it was a a casual rehearsal and um. I was really impressed with him. And then we had a lot of kid actors as well. So um, the kids did come over and, and, and I didn't really read through the scenes with them. We mostly played improv games because I just wanted to, them to be themselves and just be able to kind of uh, do whatever on the spot. I just felt comfortable that they would know their lines and they did. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really great. You had some, yeah, really beautiful performances. Yeah. Well, so did you. I mean, my goodness, how did you 
Did you, cause I didn't have casting sessions. Did you have casting sessions or did you reach out to friends or how did that all come together? Yeah, I did have casting sessions. Um, I, I, I also reached out. So Stephen Lobo, who plays my, hu- my husband, <laughs> my uh, brother. <laughs> Well, in the next one, in the next one, (laughs) there you go. He'll play your Uh, husband in your next movie. Well, he's somebody that I've known um, for a long time and that I have worked with before. And so I knew that I wanted him to film. I just didn't know the capacity. And to be quite honest, I was like, hmm, I wonder if he would be great as the root character. But then when he read it, he's like, I really love Parm. And I would love to try to bring something to that. And so I was like, maybe. <laughs> um, and so I did do a read through and he, and he read for Parm and I was like, oh, that's, he's, he's, he's really, he's got it. He's, he has that quality. Uh, but I still had him come and test. Um, and then same with like everyone, basically, like, even though I, I knew um, some of them personally, I just, I found it really important. I wanted the siblings to feel great together and have a lot of chemistry and I just wasn't able to imagine it completely I wanted to really be able to see it and um Hussein Madavji is the one person that I well Hussein and Kim um Hussein Madavji I who plays Roop I had never worked with him before um and so it was it was kind of taking a chance uh because you know what it's like when you get on set and you're like, everything is great, but if that one, you know, actor is not awesome and like inside and out, like off camera and on camera, it can really kind of like crumble everything. So I, it was just trying to create the alchemy, not only when the cameras are rolling, but also off. And it worked so well because we, the four of us got so close um, that we felt like real siblings, you know, so that when we were actually, the cameras were on, I felt like there was a real magic that was created. And then Kim Coates is Kim Coates. And so he was just awesome to work with. And I had never met him before, but he was so game and he came and, um, you know, like he had a very tight schedule. So we had to shoot all of his stuff in like three days, uh, right at the beginning. And, he really like it's so wild to me people who have been doing this forever because they he still has all that passion to like make it you know like really great and ask all the right questions and and he really sort of like he was so great that i felt like all of us just kind of brought brought it all as well we're like okay we have to maintain this sort of level of what you know this level of professionalism and was uh was such a joy it was such a joy to work that way yeah you had a celebrity in your movie which is amazing (laughs) which is what what the studios are looking for you know so I I noticed that right away and uh the rest of you you, though I feel like you're, you're you have a huge like every every actor on your film has like a fan base yeah it's cool it's cool it's cool um But definitely with Kim Coates, like how did he get involved? Did you also audition him or was it an offer? Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, that must have been a straight offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it was a a straight offer, but my producers have worked with him before. And he's a Saskatchewan boy. So he's actually from that province. He's Canadian um, and he loves coming back there. So it was just a matter of, you know, getting on the phone with him, him reading the script and, you know, just kind of making, I felt like the first conversation, he was just like sussing me out, like, who is this person and can I trust her, you know, and uh, we got along really well. So it just kind of went from there. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I think we've, I could keep talking forever and ever. I know. I feel like we haven't even like gotten to post-production, music, (laughs) all of that kind of stuff. I know. Maybe there's a part two. Yeah. There's a part two array. There's a part two. Um, But this was really amazing. And it was so great to chat with you and learn more about your process and your beautiful film, Donkey Head. Uh, Thank you, Sujata. And same to you. Congratulations. Like it's really just kind of blown up pretty wild you can find definition please on instagram facebook and twitter at definition please and also me personally on twitter facebook and instagram at sujata day you can check out donkey head at donkey head on instagram and you can check out anything about me on instagram 
Twitter and Facebook at Uggam Darshi, except for Twitter where it's at Darshi Uggam. Um, and thanks for watching Donkey Head on Netflix. Mm -hmm.